Welcome to the Inline Assembly mini lecture. In this mini lecture, I'm going to give you examples about how to include assembly statements intermixed with your C level statements. So let's start out by answering the question what is assembly language? Assembly language is the interface between hardware, the processor, and software, your code. You can think of it as a common language that both software and hardware speak. Technically, this is called the Instruction Set Architecture, ISA for short. From software's perspective, it breaks down complex, high-level computations, think of like looping through an array, into many simple, low-level operations. From hardware's perspective, it tells the hardware what needs to be done, while the hardware chooses how to do it, ideally to increase performance, and this is called the microarchitecture. So now that we know what assembly language is, why would you actually use assembly language? Well, the first case is optimization. Sometimes you can outperform the code that the compiler generates. And in general, there are many special use cases where you might want to override the code that the compiler will generate. Another case that you'd use assembly language is to leverage special knowledge about the hardware. For example, processors present many different types of special instructions that the compilers won't use unless you explicitly do it using assembly language instructions. And lastly, if you want to get the ultimate low-level control over how exactly your software uses the processor, you have to use assembly language for this. All that being said, you must have a good reason to code in assembly because generally the compiler is going to produce more correct code quicker and it's going to outperform your handwritten assembly. So who uses assembly language? Uh, security practitioners, reverse engineers, spend most of their time in assembly language. Uh, game developers, ones that have to interface with new graphics cards or desktop processors, have to use assembly language. Embedded system programmers and firmware writers often code in assembly language. Operating system and virtual machine writers have to uh, use hardware, special hardware features and manage the hardware at a very low level, so they write in assembly. Compiler backend writers use assembly language because they have to take the code that's in the compiler's intermediate representation down to an assembly language program for a specific machine. And lastly, of course, if you're going to work with tools and create tools that modify, analyze assembly language programs, well, then you have to do a lot of work in assembly language. So now that we know what assembly language is and who uses it and for what, the first question you're going to face when you try to do your own inline assembly or assembly in general is, where do you find assembly instructions? Well, before we start the search, we got to know kind of what keywords to use. The first note is that assembly language is processor and sometimes version of that processor dependent. For example, x86 is different than x86-64. ARM even has their own 64-bit instruction set and 32-bit instruction set. Even more, they have a special instruction set called a Thoma instruction set, which has 32-bit data, but only 16-bit instructions. Beyond just the processor and the version of the processor, many processors have special instruction set extensions, basically added instructions that they support. For example, a floating point unit or vector instructions, and more recently, instruction extensions that focus on security with encryption, AES, hashing, SHA, and trusted execution environments, SGX. Before you get started with assembly, be careful because the instruction behavior can be vendor dependent. For example, both Intel and AMD implement x86 and x86-64. But if you code your instruction a certain way, it may actually have different results on Intel machines versus AMD machines. Now these are very rare circumstances, but should you find yourself in long debugging sessions, you need to be aware that it could be the processor's interpretation of the instruction that's at fault, not your software. Now that you know what to look for when searching out assembly instructions, let's actually do it. So I'm on a x86-64 computer, so I'll type in x86 64 instruction set and so let's just look at the first couple of options that we see so Wikipedia they have a listing 
kind of show you kind of the different instruction sets for different the core processor and the different instruction set extensions and see we here get a listing of for example this is an ad it kind of shows you what kind of the operons are and what the op codes are so you can see different instructions here so this is one use case doesn't seem that useful for coding assembly let's look at this next one instruction set reference okay let's look at add here okay this is more useful we get exact example of how to code this up so I can see if I want to use an add I'd use the opcode add add then I have al that's a register and then I have imm8 that's an 8-bit immediate so like the value 10 for example uh, if it's unsigned anything from 0 to 255 it would be an example of some constant value you could write there you can have a 16-bit immediate so a larger constant 32-bit uh, this is pretty daunting the first time you look at it but as you practice more and more and you code more inline assembly you get a little bit more comfortable get more knowledgeable about what all these different options mean but we're going to keep it simple for this mini lecture so we'll probably use an add here and so just keep in mind that we use the opcode add then we specify some register and then we can specify values in other cases we can specify two different registers and you can see what it does if I specify for example a constant and immediate it takes that immediate and adds it to the pre-existing value in the register uh, if I do register two registers then it takes one of the registers and adds it to the second register as you can see here it takes this register r slash m8 and adds it to r8 okay so with that in mind let's work on our first example I'm going to start this coding example how I start all my programs so I'm going to use my editor and I'll call this inline.c because I'm creative and I always start out with the venerable hello world program so I'm going to print out so I need to include standard io dot h then we need to have main I'm not going to worry about arguments right now and then I'm just going to print f and then we're going to put a simple hello world statement don't forget that new line at the end okay and so here we have our hello world program I'm going to make it now compile it so I'm going to use clang because that's the compiler of the future and takes GCC arguments so pedantic want all warnings we're not going to do any optimization right now and I wanted to call the output inline dot bin and we are going to compile inline dot C and uh, let's make sure that works okay inline dot bin okay hello world okay so now let's add a little complexity so I'll take the program and I'm going to create two unsigned integers x and y I'm going to set x equal to the answer to the universe and everything and then I'm just going to swap it around for y okay then I'm going to make a little bit fancier printf statements because I want to see what these values are because uh, a little heads up to what's going to happen in the future we're going to change these values using inline assembly so I'll do hello world here and I'm going to actually put a value here and then that value the first value I'm going to put is X and then I'm going to do the same thing here but this value is going to be Y and just to differentiate the statement so I know it's printing I'm going to say goodbye world in the second one okay so we save that we're going to build it again and we're going to run it okay everything seems to be working so far so the next thing we're going to do is actually we're going to insert the simplest inline assembly you can do which is 
a no operation or no op for short. So when I want to add an inline assembly statement to my C program, I use this special command that tells the compiler, GCC and Clang understand, hey, the next thing as follows is going to be added directly to the resulting assembly file from compiling this program. I tend to always use volatile so that it doesn't get optimized away. You don't have to in most circumstances, but there's no harm in adding it, so I'll do it. And inside the string that we add, we add an assembly, one or more assembly commands, and we'll just do one for right now, and that'll be our no op command. This basically says spend time, but don't actually do anything. And by don't do anything, I mean don't update the state of the processor. Everything basically stays the same. Um, it just takes time, and the instruction pointer goes one instruction forward. So we're going to save this. We're going to go and we're going to build. And when we execute it, we would expect the same exact output as before. But uh, let's look into the program to actually see what happened to the assembly produced. So to get the assembly from our binary, we have to uh, disassemble it. So there's a tool for that object dump and we're going to pass it dash capital D and then we'll pass it the binary file and as you can see when I do this it uh, puts the disassembles it meaning it goes from the machine code back to assembly as best as it can and puts it out to standard out so we want to kind of save this and I'm going to save it to inline dot dump okay so now if we look at inline dot dump Let's look for main. So this is the assembly version of main. And so if we see here, this is our no-op that we added here that got inserted by Clang due to our inline assembly statement. Then you can see shortly after that, it calls printf. Okay. So that is our first kind of trivial example of inline assembly. Most of the time when you're using inline assembly, you want the assembly code to interact with the surrounding C code. So let's look at how to do that now. So go back into our source program, and we're going to use that add instruction. So I'll just move this down so we can remember what the add instruction looks like, how to use it. So we're going to use add. It's not case sensitive, so we're fine. And basically, is the add that takes two registers. One register will hold X, and one register will hold Y. And if we do this, so we can look at one of these examples here that takes registers. And if you can see this, over here, the effect is we add this one to this one and save it to this one. Okay? So in that case, we'd be doing the operation X equals X plus Y. Okay, so now unfortunately, it's not that easy just to list the variables, the C-level variables in your inline assembly. It takes a little bit more work to connect them. So what we do is we add symbols in our inline assembly. And so we'll say the first symbol will be percent zero, so symbol zero. And the second one will be percent one. They increase zero-based indexing. You can also use names for these, but it's most popular just to use um, numbers for this. Okay, so this says basically, compiler, I want to have two registers. You figure out what registers are optimal to assign to percent zero and percent one while you're compiling. I'm just going to use those symbols in my assembly. Okay, now here we have to connect them. Okay, so we use this structure here. We have outputs, inputs, and clobbers. Okay, so output says what registers, what values am I updating in my inline assembly? So that means what C level variables am I updating in my inline assembly? So in this case, we are going to tell it that you are going to be updating, so equals a register. So update means equals, R means register, and that register is going to be connected or hold the value of the C-level variable X. 
in a similar fashion, input says, what C level variables are you taking into your inline assembly? So in that case, we're going to say, hey, we want to send the value of Y. Y will be in a register. If it's not, the compiler will put it there for you. And then we're going to put Y there. Okay. So, and these connect to zero and one from left to right. So X happens first. So that's given the zero index. So symbol percent zero is equivalent to the value of X and percent zero one, or sorry, percent one is assigned to the value of the C level variable Y. Clobbers is where you tell the compiler, here are some effects of this code outside of the registers that you assign to percent zero, percent one. There are two things you generally use for clobbers. The one we'll use is the condition code, meaning the flags. This is an arithmetic instruction. Arithmetic instructions update the condition code. And the second one that we'll see at the end of this mini lecture is memory, meaning like this impacts memory addresses outside of the ones explicitly used in the inline assembly. And so we do that and we will save our modified inline assembly. And so what we expect to happen when run is the effect of this inline assembly is X equals X plus Y, which would mean 42 plus 24 is the new value of X. So X should be equal to 66. So we should see hello world 66 and goodbye world 24. Let's see if that's what happens. Okay, so we have our assembly language program. So let's go through and rebuild it. Okay, that seemed to work. Let's run it. Remember, we're expecting hello world 66 and goodbye world 24. And for some reason, we don't get the correct output. We get hello world 48 and goodbye world 24. Interesting. So let's use that tool I just told you about, object dump. Okay, and let's look at what the compiler produced. So we're going to go to our main because that's where we know our inline assembly is located. And so we go down. So let's look at this. The compiler produced add EAX to EAX. So instead of using two registers, one to hold the value of X and one to hold the value Y, we get one register. And if we look back up here, we can see EAX is being loaded from the stack from offset eight. And if we look up here, offset eight is first initialized to the hex value one eight. So that's 16 plus eight. So that's 24. So in fact, instead of giving X equals X plus Y, we're getting X equals two times Y. That's incorrect. But how could this happen when we used a fairly simple inline assembly instruction using an online reference? Well, the cause of this was using the wrong syntax. So there are two ways to represent instructions. There's the Intel way and the AT&T way. So let's go back into our program. So when we have, when we wrote this assembly program, we said, oh, the output should go into the first register written or the first operand that appears in the assembly instruction. That is known as Intel assembly language. And in fact, the problem you will run into when you code assembly is much of the documentation for x86-64 assembly is written in Intel assembly. Unfortunately, tools like GCC and Clang operate on what's called AT&T formatted assembly. AT&T format is the opposite of Intel, where the last most operand is actually the destination, the target of the instruction. So in this case, this needs to be zero, X, and this one needs to be Y. So now this says, actually, it the operation is percent zero equals percent zero plus percent one, or X equals X plus Y. So again, you always have to be careful, especially with X80, this is most common with X86 assembly, that you write the tools expect, unless you give them a flag, to tell them otherwise, AT&T formatted assembly, where the destination is the rightmost operand.
but most of the documentation online shows Intel formatted assembly where the destination is the leftmost operon. And it is incredibly hard to debug these things. Even in a simple case, it's hard to debug. Okay, so let's do this. We save it. So now let's build it and everything should work perfectly, right? Well, you should know that I said it that way because it does not in fact work perfectly. So let's obj dump it again and see what the compiler produced. So here we'll go to main. Okay, so we'll go down to main. And now even though we did that, it did not change the assembly output. We're still getting EAX and EAX. And if we go back, walk this back, we see EAX is being loaded from offset eight and offset eight is stored the value zero X one eight or 24. So we're getting the same thing. X is equal to two Y. So we have the assembly formatted in the right order, the right syntax, AT&T syntax, but what could be going on? Well, there's a problem with our code. It deals with the outputs. This assembly instruction both reads from and writes to percent zero, AKA X. By using equals here, we just say, oh, you only output to X. There's another symbol that we can use, plus. When we say plus, it says this is both a read and a write. So now this says percent zero can actually be read from and written to. So now when we save this and we compile and we run, we get the expected finally 66 for X and 24 for Y. And for funsies, let's look at the generated assembly for this. Go down to main. Okay, now you can see this is the add instruction. And the add is uh, taking ECX, adding it to EAX and storing the result in EAX. And you can even see uh, here it's, it's updating EAX and then you can even see later on that it will pass EAX to printf. And so uh, you can see here EAX is in fact offset 4 which is 2A so that is actually the value of X and again offset 8 is the value of Y and so this implements the exact functionality that we were looking for. So that tells us how we can actually insert one assembly language instruction and get it to interoperate with our C code. But most of the time you're going to want to do more than one inline assembly instruction. So how do you do multiple instructions? Well, the naive solution looks a little something like this, where we have multiple these statements. We'll just do three to keep it pretty simple and just make them all add since we understand how to use the add instruction. Okay. So in this case, what we expect to happen is I have X, I add Y to the value of X, then I double X and then I double it again. So it should be four times X plus Y in parentheses. That's our expected output. Generally, when we have multiple lines, we format it like this. Okay, so this is our inline assembly statement. Okay, so we're gonna compile this. Hopefully we don't get any, oh, we get an error. So what is going on here? It says invalid register name. Well, there's not really not naming registers here, so what's going on? Let's look at this next message down here. It says, note, instantiated into assembly here. So this is giving us, here is the assembly that I created from your inline assembly statement. And it's add ECX to EAX and then add, but there's no space. And so this is not valid assembly language. The problem is when you give inline assembly, the compiler literally takes what you've written, these strings, and inserts them 
into the its generated assembly for the rest of the program. It doesn't do any. It doesn't have any intelligence to do anything else. So you need to remember if you have multiple statements, you need to give it a new line because an assembly uh, file you can only have one statement per line, and so they only add one for the whole block. So if you have multiple statements per block, you need to separate each individual statement with a new line. So we can do this. And now let's try to compile again. Hey, and it works this time. Now let's see if we get the expected result. Okay, so we get 264, which in fact is 24 plus 42 times four, or 66, which is our previous response you can see up here, times two, times two again. Okay, so now we can see how to read values and write values from your C code in inline assembly and how to have multiple inline assembly statements in one block. Okay. So that covers most of the use cases. And again, you can do more creative things as you get more practice with inline assembly. This mini lecture, it's just supposed to show you how to interoperate inline assembly in C language. It's not meant to be a primer about assembly. Um, for that, I provide references at the end of the lecture. I do want to cover one last special use case for inline assembly. So this example actually shows you, honestly, the simplest inline assembly statement because it's no statement at all, but you use it for very complex reasons. It's called a compiler barrier. So again, use a creative name for this, bear.c. Okay, so we're just gonna create a, an abstract program. We're not actually compile and run this, or definitely not obj dump it. Just wanna show you some context for how you would use a compiler barrier. So I do a lot of work in energy harvesting systems. In energy harvesting systems, you break long running computation across many power cycles. So often you're restarting from some checkpoint as opposed to starting from the beginning of the program. So when we actually start main, we say, look up the last checkpoint, and we will start from there. So we'll just have some function called restart system, which loads the last checkpoint. And uh, I'm gonna actually gonna make sure to spell restart correctly, and then go from there, and I'm actually gonna make sure to make it a statement. Okay, great. And then, like many embedded systems, the heart of it is just a while one loop they run continuously. There's no sense of termination. So in this while one loop, you do some computation, some meaningful computation. And in this case, for the compiler barrier, the computation is going to update some memory. Okay, so we update some memory. And then at a certain point, I want to lock in the results of this computation because I don't know when I'm gonna lose power. So I need to, to make forward progress. I need to do some small amount of work and then save the results of that work. So that is called a checkpoint. And I'm gonna checkpoint my system state so that I can start up again. And so we have that. And so what can happen is the compiler can take code from this checkpoint system state part of your program and from the do computation update memory part of your program and it can reorder them across each other. So to prevent that from happening, you can use what's called a compiler barrier. So I'm gonna put an inline assembly statement here and in this case it is blank except for the clobbers and the clobbers we're saying, even though you know, I'm not even doesn't look like I'm updating memory, I'm telling the compiler, oh, you don't know what's going to happen to the memory, so you can't trust anything before this to not be changed by this statement. And so what this does is prevents the compiler from making assumptions about the state of memory, so it can't optimize whatever do computation update memory does and intermix it with checkpoint system state. So this means when I go to checkpoint the system, all the changes to memory have been essentially completed.
they have affected the system state. And so when I, when I checkpoint is a faithful representation of my system. Otherwise, I risk restarting the system in an inconsistent state because I only checkpointed partial update of system state. And so this is called a compiler barrier. It's just an inline assembly statement that clobbers memory that prevents the uh, compiler from carrying out some memory focused optimizations. So as stated in the opening parts of this mini lecture, real world programmers oftentimes use inline assembly. So I thought it'd be helpful for you to see an example of inline assembly in the real world. So for this example, I got it from the GNU multi, multiple precision arithmetic library. Specifically, if you download the library, the latest version, you can go into GMP forward slash MPN forward slash generic forward slash div underscore QR underscore two dot C. And you will see this file and you can see here in this file, they're defining macros that are inline assembly that they use. And these macros check for the specific process processor, maybe even version. And that helps them select what version, what implementation of the macro to put in the code. So like I said, this is a heavily used uh, open source library and they are in fact using inline assembly. And it looks basically like what we did in this example. To summarize what you learned in this mini lecture, assembly language enables low level control of the processor. It turns out that compilers only use a very limited subset of a processor's functionality, especially the modern x86-64 processors that all of us have and use today. Programmers can include uh, assembly instructions intermixed in their C, C++ programs. In uh, inline assembly instructions can interact with surrounding C level variables, reading them, writing them. Can even force the compiler not to carry out some optimizations. And maybe most importantly, if you ever have to debug this, most tools use AT&T syntax for assembly instructions and most documentation uses Intel format. So remember the assembly instruction always updates the rightmost operand listed in the assembly statement. As I said earlier in the mini lecture, this is not supposed to be a tutorial on assembly language itself. It's just tell you how you as a system programmer can include assembly level statements inside C and interwork them together. There are lots of great resources that I found for learning more about assembly language, specifically x86 assembly, and I provided them here.